Um, the difference between this extra problem and problem uh, 25, the cost of goods purchased and cost of goods sold, is in 25, the one we just did, it was a retailer where I just purchased goods and sold goods. In this problem, the question is expanded to what do these statements look like if I manufacture goods instead of purchase them? So if you can think about it, again, I'll use t-shirts quite a bit. If I buy t-shirts, I buy t-shirts, I have an inventory of t-shirts, and I sell my t-shirts. That's problem 25. In this one, what if the question would be, what if I manufacture t-shirts? If I manufacture t-shirts, I'll have an inventory of fabric, and then I'll have items that I'm working on, and then I'll have finished t-shirts. So it is somewhat similar but expanded. So in this chapter, kind of um, back in the uh, objectives, it talked about the flow of inventoriable and period costs. Well, when you have a manufacturing segment, you have three types of inventory. And these three types of inventory are raw materials, work in progress, and finished goods. So if you think about it, if I have year end or month end, what I'll have on hand if I'm manufacturing t-shirts is I'll have some fabric on hand, that's raw materials, and I'll have some finished shirts on hand that haven't been shipped out. But I'll also have a lot of shirts in progress. So we have three types of inventories, raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. And that's important and you should make a note of that. Okay, so I'm going to do this problem two ways. I'm going to do it um, the way I do it more quickly and then I'll show you the formal statement. And the formal statements are simply um, it, the same but they're sandwiched in between each one of these. If you had to do it by hand you could simply do it the shortcut. I don't know that this is the shortcut, it's just a different presentation. Uh, but anyway, when I get to the end I'll, I'll show you the difference between them two, between the two. So I have just copied and pasted the problem here so you can find it on your handout beginning uh, direct materials. Direct materials and raw materials are the same thing basically. Um, sometimes raw materials will have other types of materials in it, but I should have called this direct materials. So these are our balances in the account. So I'm going to go back to the income statement because that was in the first part of your chapter. The income statement is sales or revenue minus cost of goods sold is gross profit minus operating expenses equals operating income. And that is the format that GAAP requires. Uh, it is kind of up to you as an individual whether you expand these and show more details on this. But this is the statement, at least you have to have these headings. And different companies will break out some of these different ones um, different ways. So since this one has basically the format for all uh, statements, I just like to leave the rough framework. And then I'll go someplace else and you'll see that this is where I'm going to total up my operating expenses. So 147, 147. But we'll get to that in just a second. Each type of these inventories <coughs> follows this format. How much I started with plus what's added gives me what's available minus what's left is used. So in other words, I'll just put some numbers here. If I start with uh, five pencil or two pencils during uh, this semester, and I add, I'm not getting my computer to work very good, and I add 10 more pencils, I'll have 12 available. Okay. And of those 12, av 12 available, there's only thing, two things that can happen to them. They're either still here or gone. So they're either left, and so let's say I have five pencils left, and then the, my ending inventory would be, or how many I used, was seven. Okay, so again, I started the period with two pencils. Um, I added 10 more. That gives me 12 available and they're either still here or not still here. So if I have five still here, then I have seven that are not, that have been moved on. And so what I do is I do this same format, what I started with plus what's added gives me available minus left is what's used for the three types of inventory. And let's throw a little bit of accounting terminology for it. 
raw materials, work in process, and finished goods, all what I started with is called beginning inventory. Okay? Then what's added to raw materials are how much raw materials I've purchased. So think again, I've got fabric sitting there if I'm making t-shirts. I have beginning of amounts of fabric, plus I purchase the fabric. That gives me available, my descending inventory gives me my materials used. Then I do the same thing for whip. What I started with is beginning inventory for whip. Notice these are direct materials, work in process, finished goods. Obviously, I have different beginning inventories because there are three different inventories. So beginning inventory, and then I take what's added. Well, what's added to WIP are three different things. And so this is the only semi-complicated, but if you think about our discussions before, we either have product costs or period costs. And my product costs are direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. So what's added are total manufacturing costs, my three direct material, direct labor, and overhead. Now when we get to a, um, the formal statement, you can see I just add my three types and I just put it there. I don't necessarily name it. Though they would name this one total manufacturing costs added during the period, during the period. And so when I take my total manufacturing costs, it's what I had during the period plus what was already there. Okay, so again, beginning inventory plus what's added. What is added? Three things. Gives me available. In this case, I call it my total manufacturing costs. Again, just an accounting terminology different. Minus my ending inventory gets, gives what's used or moved on. So this is the cost of the goods that are manufactured, which should make some sense because work in progress is what's manufactured. So make sure you know that. Uh, please just practice these over and over until it becomes just pretty much common sense that if I started with two and I added 10 more, I have 12 available. Um, just the number of people who try to add ending inventory, and if you think about it, that makes no sense. Okay. And then I do the same thing with finished goods. Beginning inventory plus what's added. What is added? Cost of goods manufactured gives us available minus ending inventory as the item sold. Okay, now I want to show you the flow because the problem asks for the flow. Okay, so raw materials are used in work in progress. So I've made them colored. It is no coincidence that 69 comes up there and is that 69. And work in progress flows into finished goods, so it's no coincidence that those two numbers are the same. And cost of goods sold is sold, so it's no coincidence that that goes into the income statement there. Okay, so now all I have to do is once I have that, just plug in my numbers. So beginning direct materials is 15, ending direct materials is 17. So I'm just going to plug in those numbers. Beginning work in progress and ending work in progress, 24 and 20, 24 and 20. Finish goods, 16 and 25, 16 and 25. Okay, and then it says purchases of direct materials, 71. So I'm going to add purchases. Notice this is direct materials used, so occasionally you'll have a problem that gives you direct materials used and then you have to back into purchases. Again, if you put it in the framework and you just kind of back up into it, you can figure it out. Um, go here, I'll just hold that on there. Direct manufacturing labor is 20000 that's there. Uh, indirect manufacturing labor, that's an overhead item. So um, in your homework problem, it just expands those and lists them out here. But since I like to keep this framework, I'm just going to put my indirect manufacturing labor down here. I'm going to total them up. See, this is 40000 And I've got that pulling up there to 40000 Okay. Plant insurance. Again, I ask myself, is it a product or period cost? It's a product cost, and it's not direct materials or direct labor, so it's overhead. So I go down there. Um, Depreciation, I should have said depreciation on the uh, factory because that's an important, if I could spell. Okay, um, because if it's depreciation on the administrative building, it's going to go into selling an administrative. But depreciation on the factory is 17000 and repairs and maintenance, again, I should have said factory there, of 2000 Marketing and distribution costs, those are period costs because they're selling. So put those down. Operating expenses are selling and administrative, by the way. 
and general administrative of 36,000. Um, and this is my sales. I should have not put um, sales and revenue. So write that down on your sheet there. So I have sales revenue of 282, so I put that down on my income statement. And so now that I have those in there, all I have to do is start plugging in the numbers. So I'm going to add up my manufacturing overhead of 40,000, put it up there. I'm going to add up my um, selling and administrative expenses of 147 and put it in there. Again, you can expand these. I just leave it in this framework and put these extra tables because I fill out these templates and then plug them in. Okay, so uh, beginning inventory plus purchases equals available of 86 minus ending inventory is 69. The 69 comes up there. Add the three numbers of 129. Um, 24 plus 129 is 153 minus ending inventory is cost of goods manufactured. Um, this comes up there. I have beginning inventory plus what's added, which is cost of goods manufactured is available minus ending inventory is cost of goods sold. This comes down there. So I have sales, that number, I just plugged it in already. Sales minus cost of goods sold is gross profit. Um, again, don't add cost of goods sold, you subtract expenses. Minus my operating expenses gives me operating income of 11000 Okay, so how you work these out is kind of up to you. I'm going to show you the solution on this other sheet. This is actually the formal statement. Okay, and I left these up here to show you the, what they do. So what they do is they simply combine these two in one statement and sandwich this whole thing in there. Okay, they also technically move beginning inventory down here before ending inventory. Um, it's neither here nor there, it doesn't matter. I'm just showing you this because your online homework requires it in a certain setup. This is how you set it up like this in two separate schedules or one big schedule is kind of up to you in the real world except for your online homework won't let you have that choice. All right, so I'm going to put these two together and I'm going to move beginning inventory down here. Okay, so I'm just putting it right down here before ending inventory, okay? So I'd have 129 and then I'd have 24,000 and then I'd add the two to get 153. All right, so if you look at it, let's look at this portion right here and compare it to here. I have beginning inventory plus purchases gives us available minus ending inventory is direct materials used. So they sandwich that right in this formal statement. Then I add my direct labor right there um, instead of putting one line for manufacturing overhead where I totaled it, I simply put them all there. So look at this, and these are all right here. Okay, So right here I have direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. And in this column I have direct materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. And just sandwich these two statements right in that statement. Then I have my costs incurred during the period, 129, which I have my total there. I add my beginning inventory, so I have it ahead of it, they have it after it. Gives us total manufacturing costs, subtract my ending inventory, and I get my cost of goods manufactured. Okay, so that's your formal cost of goods manufactured statement. Again, um, just practice it. I've got beginning inventory plus what's added, gives us available, minus ending inventory, gives what's moved on. And so I write them like these so I can have the same format for all three of them. All right. Then the income statement is simply this right here with the cost of goods sold statement up here sandwiched in there. So let's kind of look at this right here. Okay. And I'm going to go down here. Okay. So I have beginning inventory plus purchase or plus cost of goods manufactured. Gives us available minus finished goods invent ending inventory. Gives us cost of goods sold. So that statement is sandwiched right in there. So I have sales 282 minus cost of goods sold. They have the whole statement. Gives us gross margin um, minus operating expenses. They simply list them out, but look at the total. They have 11,000. Okay. So question on different columns. We use generally have different columns just to make it more visually appealing because if you think about it if I move these numbers over here okay um,
becomes real confusing which ones you add to get this total number. So what you do is you um, back it up and you put it into a different column. And so if you think about the framework that I used, um, besides moving beginning inventory, beginning inventory plus the costs that are added gives us available minus ending inventory is cost of goods manufactured. Generally that framework is over here in its own column. And then any subtotals that you want, um, you back up so you don't have to jump numbers while you add them. And this, revenues minus cost of goods sold is gross profit minus um, operating expenses gives you operating income. Okay. As far as dollar signs, I missed this dollar sign here. Uh, formal statements do a couple of things, and, and you'll have to do this on your cases. Never do this. You got to get on a number to show you what to not do. Okay. Never mix decimal points with cents without decimal points. The numbers don't line up and it's very confusing. So if you think about this, if you had this, it's very error prone and sloppy, quite frankly, to add a number with no cents and add a number with cents and then get a number with no cents. Um, mistakes can be made, but you will never see a formal statement that has some sense and some without sense. So I need to make sure they're all formatted the same. Um, occasionally you'll see it if you multiply. So for instance, if I have a, a hundred units and the cost per unit is 0.5865, okay, and I want to multiply my hundred units times the cost per unit uh, simply because if I rounded it to 59, I'm going to have lots of rounding errors because I'm it's almost li honestly like especially if that's 0.585. So I have 100, and if I rounded it to uh, 59, you can see that, not a whole lot, but let me make this. Okay, so now I've got a $500 difference just because I've got a rounding difference of um, 0 0.005 on each item. And so, that is one time where you can have sense when you have a cost per unit you're used. Sometimes you'll have, um, in this one, sales price always is in cents or round dollars, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but sometimes your cost of goods sold, your cost per unit might, you might want to round it to three or four decimal points. So, but generally speaking, in a formal statement, when you're adding up numbers so the numbers have to line up, you always consistently use the same amount of cents. Um, in budgets, we tend to leave off the cents. Um, if you're guessing anyway, why would you put on cents? Um, it just kind of implies an exactness that's not there in a budgeting process. So if you have a formal st statement on a test, um, just show what you've done. I can follow your math pretty easily um, as far as showing sense or no sense. And same thing with case problems. That's probably more relevant than tests or case problems. You just need to show it, but watch out for your presentation. And again, you use different columns just simply to make it look prettier. You may see a, a financial statement with three, four columns in it. And they're simply just, let's say if the purchases of direct materials, if they wanted to show how that is, they'd back it up into a prior column. And they would say, okay, that 71,000 or that 71,000 is made up of these three things and it's add up to that. So that's it. Um, I would encourage you to practice these. Um, I can do them, but it's because I've practiced them a whole lot. And I just want to remind you that uh, accounting, you don't get better by looking at it. Um, I'll say this several times, possibly. I've probably said it before. I can't remember who I've said it to, what classes. But if you simply sit there and watch me do something, um, I call that being a spectator. Okay, you never get better at um, any event that you watch, like let's say you've watched an athletic event, you never get really a lot better by spectating. Um, spectating is important, it's important to watch how people do it, but you simply would not ever um, watch a game of ice hockey and then watch and watch and watch and be the biggest fan ever and expect to go out on the court and be great at it. You have to actually get out there with a puck and a stick. And that's the same thing with this. If you simply watch me do it, 
um, you can watch me get better. I would prefer that you get better, not me, uh, since your grade is based on it. So make sure you practice it. Thanks.